this video is on Ram Air Parachute Flight, some terminologies and some characteristics that we can talk about to describe uh, individual parachutes. So have you ever wondered uh, what's going on when your parachute's opening and why in the world is it even able to fly? So let's take a few um, seconds to look at some opening shots. So after throwing out your pilot chute, your container opens, the deployment bag will come out, and then you've got line stretch. Now the parachute's able to come out of the deployment bag and it begins to inflate. As you can see, the center cell or the base of the wing, uh, they're gonna start to inflate first. So the air rushes into the nose cells <clears throat> because of how it's designed in the back, the tail of the parachute air is not able to escape. And that's why it's considered a ram air design. So the center cell is cells are going to inflate first and then um, cells that are further out towards the wingtips begin to inflate. You can see the slider is all the way up in this photo, but then it will start to travel down the lines and the slider's main um, purpose is to slow down the inflation, to slow down the opening. And here we have an almost fully inflated parachute. You see the slider is just about down um, at the end of the risers. And in this picture, you can see just a tiny sliver and the riser is orange there. So that's what it looks like when it's opening. So why is it that parachutes are even able to fly. So let's look at this diagram here. And so what we're gonna look at first is gravity, or we can even think of this as our weight. And so that's gonna be us, the jumper, and all the gear that we have on. Um, a lot of times we refer to this as exit weight. On an airplane, you would have engines that would move you forward providing thrust, but we don't have engines on a sport parachute. So instead, we can see that parachutes have been designed to angle slightly downward so that gravity can be used to power our sport parachute. So if you were to measure the line groups, we've got A lines, B lines, C lines, D lines, and these are our brake lines. You'll find that the C lines are gonna be shorter than the D lines, the B lines will be shorter than the C lines, and the A lines are gonna be the shortest of them all. So depending on which parachute you jump, the trim angle or that tilt that a manufacturer has built into their wing, that can vary quite a bit. And in the end, it's the weight, you and your gear, your exit weight, that pulls the wing down and forward. So we also have drag. That's the force that wants to hold us back from moving forward. Some people refer to this as air friction. So an object that has more surface area is gonna encounter more air molecules and therefore have more drag. And that's why we see race cars and airplanes built with more streamlined shapes that allow them to go faster because they have reduced drag. When we're talking about parachutes, lift is gonna be the force that is opposite of gravity or weight. And it's the lift that's actually gonna keep us from plummeting down to the earth. And that's when we need to start talking about airfoils. So what is an airfoil? An airfoil is a structure that has a curved surface and that gives a favorable ratio of lift to drag while in flight. I'm not really gonna get into why lift is generated as it's a bit of a mathematical mess and there really just isn't a great explanation of it. Uh, just know that there's lots of different airfoils out there and new ones are always being designed and tested. But we can look at something familiar. So here we have a cross view of bird's wings. So we all know that birds do a pretty good job of flying, those that can fly. And if you were to look at a bird's wing from the side, you'd notice it has two curved surfaces. And we could also see that depending on what type of bird it is, so here this is an albatross, sorry, this is a bit fuzzy of a picture. Um, and down here we have an eagle and a hawk that um, depending on if they're gonna be great at diving or gliding, they're gonna have different airfoils. And it's the same thing with a parachute. Depending on what the designers want the parachute to do, uh, they can choose different airfoils. So that's a pretty simple overview of why parachutes fly. So let's take a look at what makes parachutes fly differently from one another and how you can go about even trying to choose what might be a good main parachute for you. So there's lots of different parachutes out there. This is just a sample of some of the model names that a lot of times get thrown around. Well, you're looking at all these and you're like, how in the world am I even gonna know what to pick? It's kind of similar to vehicles in a way. So what you want to do with a vehicle, your goals, how you're planning on using it, is gonna uh, guide your choices when it comes to, am I gonna purchase a van or am I gonna purchase a sedan, maybe an SUV versus I'm gonna get a sports car. And just like vehicles, there are different parachute manufacturers as well as different parachute models. 
So we're gonna come back to choosing a main parachute in a little bit, and we're gonna turn our attention now to even the anatomy of a parachute so that we know how to talk about these things. So a bit of terminology. So we've got a leading edge or the nose of the parachute, and that's where the air rushes into the cells, the cells here in the front on the nose, air rushes in and it's trapped there because the trailing edge or the tail is where the top skin and the bottom skin are sewn together. So then we've got ribs and those are gonna be um, these pieces of fabric that go from front to back. And we have loaded ribs as well as unloaded ribs. So a loaded rib just means that it's a rib where there are line attachment points there and unloaded means that there are no lines attached to that one. And then quite a few parachutes also have this fabric that's on the side and we call those stabilizers. When we're talking about very high performance parachutes, you might also hear the terminology cross bracing. So cross bracing is gonna be these little Vs that we can see that are black on this parachute. And that helps to make for a more rigid and therefore responsive wing, but it also adds bulk. So these pack up larger than a similarly sized non cross based parachute. And they're also gonna cost a lot more because extra fabric, more sewing and that kind of stuff. So you're only gonna find these on very high performance parachutes. So like I said, what makes them so different? So John LeBlanc, who is, uh, I believe, VP over at Performance Design, and he's one of their uh, parachute designers, he says that there's essentially uh, six top variables that make a difference in how a parachute's gonna fly. And he also adds in um, when his talk that he made at BPA a few years ago that there's also some magic that goes into it too. But the top six variables are gonna be the size or the area of the parachute, then airfoil type, the trim of the parachute, what's the aspect ratio, what is that anhedral arc, and finally, what is the plan form? So we're gonna go through these. I'm gonna kind of skip number one because I think that's fairly self-explanatory. What is the size or the area of the parachute uh, from one to another? So let's go, we've already talked a little bit about airfoil here. I've <clears throat> given you different airfoils from airplanes. And once again, airfoil just means it's a cross-sectional shape of a wing. So you can even see that in airplanes, depending on if you want an aerobatic plane versus a glider, um, or if you want a high lift sailplane, this says here, or you're just going out doing some normal flying, different airfoils are going to provide you either more lift, more glide, depending on what you're gonna use it for. So same thing with parachutes. So what's the trim angle? So the trim angle is gonna be if you draw a line through the cord, which is going to be essentially going from the back of the parachute to the front of the parachute. And you look at that versus the horizon. This is gonna be your trim angle here. So this is pretty much up to the manufacturer. It's their decision on how flat or floaty, some people say a parachute is, or is it a parachute that is ground hungry or pretty steep, likes to come out of the sky quickly. So again, that's built into the parachute by the manufacturer and there's really not a whole lot that you can do to change that trim angle. Aspect ratio was another of the variables. So aspect ratio is going to be wingspan. So that measurement from one side to the other divided by the cord. So once again, cord is that going to be that measurement from the nose to the tail. And when you look at the relationship between the two, you have an aspect ratio. So if they were exactly the same, if they were one to one, you'd have a perfect square, um, which we don't really fly perfect squares in skydiving. They're always gonna be at least somewhat rectangular if they're, we're looking at a reserve parachute, for example. So that would be a lower aspect ratio. And then the skinnier your rectangle is gonna get, uh, so you have a longer wingspan compared to your cord, that's gonna be a higher aspect ratio. And in general, there are a few things that we can say about these. So a lower aspect ratio, those are gonna be the parachutes that are kind of known for being able to sink down. Uh, as we can see here, that my lowest aspect ratio is actually a, um, an accuracy canopy. So they're very um, good at being able to get into brakes and not really move forward much, but just be able to sink down. They're known for having pretty good openings, reliable openings, and usually they're not really known for a lot of flare power. On the other end of the spectrum here, we've got the Valkyrie, which is PD's uh, one of their latest 
uh, high performance parachute. So we can see it's a long skinny wing compared to that uh, accuracy canopy. And a higher wing loading is known for flatter glides and better landings because they can generate more lift. So then we have the anhedral arc. So this is going to be what is that angle from the base of the parachute to the wingtips. And anhedral is meaning that there's going to be a downward slope from the base of that wing. So depending on when you're looking at a parachute, um, what is that angle? And then finally, the last variable is plan form. So plan form is like when you're looking down at a parachute, um, what shape is it that you see? So this first one here, um, I got all of these once again from the Jean, Jean LeBlanc talk, uh, which I'm gonna link down in the description because I think it was really rather interesting to listen to. But this is a stiletto 150. So this is plan form being, once again, you're looking down um, from the top of the parachute and seeing what shape it has. So you can see that it looks actually kind of fairly rectangular until you get towards the ends where we've got a little bit of tapering going on here. And we can compare that to a Velocity, which is uh, another high performance parachute. And we can see that the Velocity actually um, is more rounded. So a lot of people would call the Velocity as fully elliptical, but I mean, as you can see, we don't have a full ellipse here because the ends are truncated. But what's interesting is if you compare the Velocity plan form to here we've got a saber too. If we overlay these, they're going to be pretty similar. And most people uh, would consider a saber two, or now we've got a saber three, but that would be more of maybe an intermediate parachute versus a velocity is definitely not an intermediate parachute. This is going to be more for the advanced um, canopy pilot. But they've got very similar looking plan forms. So that's the last variable of the six. So here's um, uh, some beginner parachutes that a lot of times are recommended from top three manufacturers that we typically see in Florida. So we've got Performance Designs, which I've been pulling from a lot, and we've got Aerodyne and Icarus Canopies. So they all have a student version that they recommend. And then the beginner to intermediate, it just really depends on how much you're loading that parachute. So how small is the parachute for the weight that you're putting on underneath? Because some of those beginner parachutes can pretty quickly become intermediate parachutes if you're loading them pretty heavily or even loading them moderately actually. So for example, many people would say that a Sabre 3 would be an okay beginner parachute as long as it's loaded fairly lightly. So how can we go about, um, I guess even talking about parachute performance and trying to decide what is it that we like in a parachute, what don't we like? Because everybody's gonna be a little bit different about what they're comfortable with. So we can kind of break this down into three parts. So we've got openings, we've got um, what they're like for in-air characteristics, and then finally, what's it like to be able to land that parachute. So when we're thinking about openings, we have snatch force. And that's gonna be the force that's felt uh, when the lines are stretched out and under load. Snivel is gonna be the amount of time that the slider stays up before it travels down the lines. And then a lot of people are concerned about, am I gonna have an on-heading opening? Or is this a parachute that's known for kind of searching around before taking off in a certain direction? So here I've got a video just showing uh, two different parachutes that I've been jumping lately, and hopefully you can see the difference between their openings. The first parachute, which is gonna be red, um, you'll see that its opening is just a little bit longer, so the slider stays up for a little bit longer before coming down, and uh, the opening is a little bit slower in general. So here it's inflating, and now slider's coming down. The next one you're gonna see, the opening is pretty quick, and there's not a whole lot of time for a snivel. Slider comes down fairly fast. So we're gonna see those again. So here's the first one. Slider takes just a little bit longer to come down. And the second one, it's almost an immediate opening. Both of them very much on heading openings. So the first one is from Fluid Wings. It's their Echo. I would say that's um, intermediate to advanced parachute. It's what they recommend before somebody goes to a cross brace canopy. And the second one is Performance Designs, their Pulse. So this is kind of a sporty canopy, but depending on how um, light or heavy you're loading it, uh, it could be more beginner to intermediate. 
So you can see that the pulse, like I said, its opening was pretty quick, it was on heading, and there was not a whole lot of sniffle time. Whereas the first one, the Echo, there was more sniffle time and the opening was not quite as fast. So in air, what are we gonna be thinking about? Well, a lot of people like to think about glide path. So this is tied to the trim angle, right? How floaty is my parachute or is it something that's coming down um, and is very ground hungry, a lot of people call it. And then what is my control range like? So is this a parachute that it's easy to hang out and breaks a whole lot and it does fine or maybe it doesn't like that too much or, and just also how is it like on the rear risers? Um, same thing with the responsiveness to any sort of input. So we've got our toggles, front risers, rear risers, and also harness turns. How responsive is this parachute to that? Depending on um, the different variables that are out there, there are certain parachutes that are very responsive to harness input and other parachutes, not so much. And then finally, we also have people thinking about the recovery arc. So whenever you give some sort of input, for example, let's say I do a toggle turn, and then once I let up, how quickly is the parachute gonna come out of that turn and go back to its normal flight? So some parachutes have a very short recovery arc. Other parachutes, they like to stay in that dive for longer, so they would have a longer recovery arc. And then finally, what most people really focus on is landing. So how much flare am I gonna be able to get out of this parachute? Um, is it known for doing better with a single stage flare versus a two stage flare? So those are all kind of um, talking points when you're thinking about how to evaluate a parachute and what might be good for you and what you actually prefer. Next, we're gonna go into what else is out there that will affect performance. So we've gone over um, the parachute design itself and how that can affect performance and how we can talk about performance. And then in a later video, we'll talk about uh, drag. So how can we reduce drag so that we can improve our performance from the parachute. What happens when we change the environment that they're jump we're jumping in? What if we're jumping at a higher altitude? What if we're jumping in hotter or colder temperatures? What about humidity and how does turbulence affect our parachute performance? And then finally, we're gonna go into a little bit of a discussion about wing loading and what difference does it make if you're lightly loading a parachute versus heavily loading a parachute? And that was the end for our overview. So I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, um, if you're interested and you've got some time, go ahead and watch that John LeBlanc video because I think it's very interesting um, to see how a lot of times when we're talking about rectangular versus elliptical versus semi-elliptical versus tapered, that a lot of times that's actually just marketing speak and doesn't really have a whole lot of bearing on today's sport parachutes.